good examples there. I think one of the things that we want to take a second and sort of jump into here is really a little bit about the proportioning and to understand a little bit, uh, again, we'll, we'll make sure that we go through what internal curing is again. We'll talk a little bit about some of the principles that are used. Now there's a lot of potential detail that we could get into. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try to skip a lot of that detail and give you two or three really quick ways that you could either mix proportion something or get a relatively good, uh, good idea on this. Um, this is described, uh, the, the process of curing as we've talked about is described. ACI 308 has a uh, description here, but we're essentially just providing water and time and heat for the sample to, uh, to, gain, uh, to gain strength and to cure. And everything that we're doing is exactly compliant with this definition of what curing is. All right, so conventional curing is external moisture. All right, what we're doing is we're providing that moisture, we're maintaining the moisture to allow the reactions to occur in the overall system. As we mentioned before, external cur curing uh, is water from the outside, just like a lobster has an external skeleton. All right, there's two different ways you could have skeletons, there's two different ways you could cure. The lobster is a lot better to eat, and I don't know, maybe the external curing is a lot better to do something else. All right. We talked about this, but the internal curing is a lot like the bone structure that we have. We're just doing the exact same thing from the inside out. Now, as we talked about, the high performance concrete is dense, all right? So we want to make sure we get that water throughout the system, and we're going to fight this thing called self desiccation. So now is where I'm going to slow down. All right, I've gone, I've gone through, you know, you probably said there, we went through 15 slides in like two minutes, but it's all stuff that we've been reviewing. What I want to do now is I want to talk a little bit about this idea of self-desiccation. And simply, it's like drying from the outside, but it's not losing water from the outside. It's happening because of the hydration reaction. So it's essentially a reduction in the internal relative humidity as the pores are empty. That's all it is. It's essentially reducing the activity of the water. Right? So what causes the pores to empty? All right, essentially it's this idea that we've got that chemical shrinkage that's taking place. And this happens every single day for anybody who's using Portland cement. All right, I once had somebody who stood up and they said, we have orange trucks, it doesn't happen in these, it only happens in green trucks. I don't care what color the truck is. All right, if it's Portland cement, it happens to you. All right, now the real question is, does this happen irrespective of a water to cement ratio? And the answer is yes. If you have a 0.6 water to cement ratio, it happens, but there's so many big pores that essentially that water stays act more active in those systems. In lower water to cement ratio systems, that 0.4, that 0.35, those systems, there's much less of those big pores, so losing that little bit of water makes a much bigger difference, which is why this becomes a big issue in high performance concrete. Now, one of the basic principles, and as I said, I feel embarrassed every time I say this, we spent two years to find out all of this stuff about aggregate spacing is really solved if you use fine lightweight aggregate. Right? So there are a lot of people who want to argue and say, well, we can do it with coarse, coarse aggregate. You can do it with coarse aggregate, but it's much harder to get that distribution of water throughout the entire system. If you do it with the fine lightweight aggregate system, it's much easier to get it distributed throughout the system. Not one of the North American lightweights that we tested was unable to get sufficient, they were all able to get sufficient spacing all right, with the replacement levels that we used. So it's almost automatically built into those systems. If you use sand to do this, you automatically have the right amount of spacing. So the next question is how much lightweight aggregate slash water do you need inside of the system? So we talked about this testing that this guy named Le Chatelier had done. Um, and the basic thing is, again, I want to go back to this. We spent an enormous amount of time trying to figure out how much chemical shrinkage takes place in the overall system. For almost every system, you want to have seven pounds of additional water for every 100 pounds of cement. Right? So if you have 600 pounds of cement in your mix, you need 42 pounds of water to make up that space. Right? Now, does this depend on the cement chemistry? Yes. Does this vary if you use supplemental cementitious materials, flyish or slag? Yes. But your answer is almost always going to be between six and eight. So if you want to go to a professor convention and watch them fight, it's 5.2, it's 5.3, it's 5, it's 5 that's fine, but if you use seven pounds of water, that's a really good rule of thumb, right? So again, all we're trying to do is we're trying to meet the law of supply and demand, right? We know that 
Cell desiccation is going to require us about seven pounds of water for every 100 pounds of cement. We want to provide enough lightweight aggregate to hide seven pounds of water in the overall system. So it's nothing more than this balancing act. We'll show equations later. They'll have Greek symbols. It'll be, it'll be awesome, right? That's all we're doing is balancing the teeter tire. Okay. So how much lightweight aggregate do we use? Rule of thumb, seven pounds per every hundred weight. Now, usually the next question is, is it cement or cementitious? And the answer is yes. All right. If you only have cement in your system, use all the cement that's there. If you have cement plus slag, slag has a higher chemical shrinkage, but less slag reacts than cement. So they kind of balance each other out. And it's the same with fly ash, and it's the same with silica fume. Silica fume actually has the highest chemical shrinkage in the system, but the lowest reactivity. Right? And it's used in very, very low volumes. All right? So uh, properties of the aggregate. Right? The aggregate needs to have two main properties, and the first one is really easy. It needs to have pores that you can hide the water in. So it needs to be a porous aggregate, and we've talked a little bit about that. The second one is a little bit more subtle. Right? And the second one is your aggregate has to desorb the water. Right? And you're probably sitting there going, wow, that's great. I've never had a class where we've talked about desorption. My DOT doesn't require it. What is desorption? It's the ability of the water to leave the aggregate. All right? And believe it or not, that's actually a property that you could measure, is how the water leaves the aggregate. Now, I've shown you two curves. This blue curve is a good looking curve from a desorption perspective. Right? Lots of water leaves at high humidities. This red curve is slightly less attractive because only a fraction of the water leaves. What is the difference from a pore size discussion here? The blue curve is bigger pores. The red curve is tiny pores. And if you get into things like a natural pumice, for example, you can have very, very small pores. They'll actually fight the matrix for the water. All right, so rather than giving the water back, they'll actually fight the matrix for the water. So if you have something that has 20% porosity, but it doesn't desorb, it doesn't work. Right now, the good news, and I will show this a little bit later, all the North American lightweight aggregates that are expanded follow this blue line. All right? So if you use North American lightweight aggregates, expanded clays, shales, and slates, did I get all of them? Yep. I got all of them. All right, they're along the blue line, and I'll show you a plot later on that will uh, we'll confirm that. All right, so now we know that the magic is in the rocks. Right? And Jeff is going to give us a little bit of the background on the magic.